Mahmoud Gabe Hospital. And I'm going to give a lecture or lectures uh, this morning. The first lecture will be on ultrasound assessment of the placenta. So it's unfortunate that we are starting with this lecture when you haven't uh, scanned even a single patient to see what the placenta looks like on ultrasound scan. So for the placenta, what are we supposed to assess and how are we supposed to do it? First of all, we should establish where the placental body is, that is the position, the exact position where the placenta is. We should describe the placental appearance in terms of grading, is it grade one, two, or three? And then we should assess the function of the placenta because it has a lot of uh, uh, input in the fetal well-being. We should then assess if there's any placental pathology and assess the relationship of the placenta to the cervical internal os. Assessment of the placenta can be done transabdominally or transvaginally. So if it's in the upper segment, it's easier to examine the placenta using the transabdominal approach and complete the whole examination using that technique. However, if it's low lying, you may need to combine the transabdominal approach and the transvaginal approach as well. So this is what the placenta looks like on ultrasound scan. You can see a mass that is uh, attached on the anterior segment of the uh, uterus. For status, we need to understand that this, what is um, shaped like uh, a cave here, is the probe, the ultrasound scan probe. The next layer here is the maternal skin, the anterior abdominal wall. In this, what is looking a little bit darker Okay, so uh, the curved part here is the probe on the anterior abdominal wall. This image is showing placental assessment using the transabdominal approach. So what's looking like a curve here on the upper part is the transabdominal probe. And then the next layer is the maternal anterior abdominal wall. And then this part that is looking a little bit darker than the maternal anterior abdominal wall is the uterus. And we can see it's going all the way down baby like that. This is the baby inside the uterus. And this mass here is the placenta. In this case, it's in the anterior upper segment and extending all the way to the fundus. In this image, we are demonstrating a posterior placenta. We can see the posterior uterine wall here and the placental mass that is marked in yellow. So these images are now showing a placenta that is encroaching into the lower segment. In the first image here, we can see that this is the cervix. Now this is the transvaginal approach. This is the probe. And the bladder is supposed to be somewhere here. So once we insert the uh, transvaginal probe inside the vagina, and then we can visualize the cervix posterior to the probe. This is the anterior lip of the cervix. The cervical canal 
in the posterior lip of the cervix. This is the cervical external os, cervical internal os. And now we are inside the uterus. We are looking from down below. And we can see that there is a mass that is in the lower segment of the uterus here. And this is the plus center. So if it's looking like this, and it's within four to five centimeters from the cervical internal os, we have to measure the exact distance of the leading edge of the placenta from the cervical internal os. That's okay. So in this other image, the placenta is low lying, but it's in the posterior segment. So again, we can see the transvaginal probe just putting minimal pressure on the anterior lip of the cervix. The posterior lip of the cervix, the internal os, the external os, and the edge of the placenta is just touching the cervical internal os. So for the images that I, 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 I just showed you, if we are to draw a schematic drive diagram of those images, it will be looking something like this. So it means the placenta is approaching the cervical internal os. And when it's like that, there is a risk that when the patient gets into labor in the cervical dilatation, at some point, the placental surface is going to be exposed and the patient can start bleeding. This is what is demonstrated in the second image here. With cervical dilatation, the part of the placenta that, is, that was partially covering the internal os becomes exposed. The maternal surface of the placenta becomes exposed and the patient can bleed. So, very important for us to establish the placental location. The placental location and the relationship of the placenta to the cervical internal os. Because if the mother has a low lying placenta, that pregnancy becomes a high risk pregnancy because of the likely risk of bleeding with cervical dilatation. And a decision for the mode of delivery should be made in the antenatal period, not during labor. So you need to establish the placental position and location so that the caregivers can decide on the mode of delivery. Is it safe for the mother to dilate on that low lying placenta or she needs cesarean section before she gets into labor? That's why we are emphasizing on us being able to locate the placenta and to report where exactly where it is. So now there is a, a new classification for the placental position. We just want to compare it with the old classification so that we are all on the same page. In the old classification for the first images that I showed you, if the placenta is in the um, anterior or posterior high segment, it's just referred to as a high placenta. And even in the new classification, it's referred to as a high placenta. So for the purposes of reporting, we say it's anterior high or posterior high or fanda. We are describing where the placenta is. Anterior high segment, posterior high segment or fanda. In the old classification, there is what was referred to as a low lying placenta, which uh, described the placenta that was in the lower uterine segment. So even in the new classification, it is still referred to as a low lying placenta. This is a placenta that is lying in the lower 
usual statement. We can have um, a placenta that is touching the leading edge, touching just getting at the level of the cervical internal host, like what is shown in this image. So in the previous classification, it was referred to as a marginal placenta. But for the new classification, it's placenta previa. So if it's approaching the cervical internal os, you report it as placenta previa. If it's partially covering, probably covering more than what it's doing in this image, it's still a placenta previa. If it's completely covering, in the old classification, it was called major placenta previa. This is just referred to as placenta previa. So why is it important to classify the placenta? I will already explain that for this reason is the cervix will dilate and open up on a placenta that is touching, completely covering, or within two centimeters of the cervical internal os, it will end up exposing the maternal surface of the placenta and the mother can bleed. Okay, so the placental appearance, it's important for us to examine the appearance of the placenta or to assess the appearance of the placenta. So for us to do that, we need to show the whole mass of the placenta. This is usually possible in the early gestational ages, maybe for uh, 30, 34 weeks. But in the advanced gestational ages, around 36, 38 weeks, it becomes a little bit difficult. So when we are able to do it, we need to show the whole mass of the placenta. What does it look like? We measure the thickness of the placenta around the area of the insertion of the cord, which is somewhere here. We measure the thickness of the placenta. If that placenta is measuring more than four centimeters, more than four centimeters, then there is placental median. Are we together? The placenta is big. If it measures more than four centimeters in the total thickness. Fine. And then we also look for unequate spaces within the placenta, like this one, something looking like this or that. We refer to them as um, placental legs. Some of them can be vascularized, some of them can just be simple fluids accumulating within the placenta. And we know that the placenta is supposed to play a vital role to transfer nutrients and oxygen from the maternal to the fetus. So if we are having these areas, these legs accumulating within the placenta, then it shows that the placenta is not working well. We also check in the ritual placental space. Okay, so this is the placental body and that's the uterine wall. The space between the placenta and the uterine muscle is referred to as the ritual placental plot. So it should be nice and thin, just like what's shown in this image. When you start seeing some things accumulating behind the placenta or between the placenta and the uterine wall, like what we can see in this image, there's this area that's separating the placenta from the uterine wall. There's accumulation of blood in the ritual placental space, the space behind the placenta. So that's a blood clot. And it means this patient had, the patient had what? What was the diagnosis? 
a virtual class center. So for the appearance, we should also braid the class center. For braiding, we just have to remember that a placenta that is still within the first trimester, in the first trimester to almost the first half of the second trimester, the placenta is supposed to be grade one. Should look nice and homogeneous like what is what's looking in this area. And then from the second half of the uh, second trimester to the third trimester, it's grade two. The placenta is aging, right? Because it's working every day. There will be deposition of fibrin, calcium, somehow, somehow, because it's working. So the appearance of the placenta changes with progression of the gestational age, naturally. And then in the third trimester, we start seeing more and more calcification and more white patches appearing in the placental mass. So we need to assess the placental grading. It's important because in patients with placental pathology, like in patients with preeclampsia, we can have a placenta that's showing lots of calcification, cloudy calcification, fibrin deposition within the placental mass. That is very important because it's already disturbing diffusion, active uh, transport, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, what is supposed to be taking place in the placenta naturally. So all those processes of transferring nutrients and oxygen from the mother to the baby will be disturbed because of the presence of those abnormalities in the placenta. So for assessing the placental appearance, we are also trying to assess the function of the placenta. Are we together? Okay, so what are the different pathologies that we can pick up when we assess the placenta? We can pick up a huge placental mass, placental migali. I've already described what that is. We can pick placental legs, like what you can see in this image. You see those black things? These areas, this area in that area. So do you think this part of the placenta is functioning normally? It's not. We can also pick placenta previa. This is a cervix here in the placenta covering the cervical internal os. Fine. So I have already explained that we should assess the function of the placenta. So you can see in this image, the placenta is looking sort of a uh, great two. This placenta is appearing like a great two placenta. And the function of this placenta in terms of transporting oxygen and nutrients from the mother to the fetus is totally different from the function of a placenta that is looking like this. You can see in this image, the placenta has is what are looking like clouds. These patches, white patches. Are we together? So these are hyper equate areas within the placenta. So these areas, they disturb the function of the placenta, they disturb diffusion, simple, beep, simple, facilitated, active trans, they disturb because they've disturbed, distorted the nature of the placenta itself. So what does it mean if the placenta is looking like that. We are getting reduced oxygen and nutrient supply to the fetus. And this fetus will not grow according to what is expected for the gestational age, or will not grow to achieve its genetically determined potential because there is a limitation at the very area that should be assisting 
the fetus to grow well. Are we together? Fine. So, move on. If we pick a low lying placenta between 20 and 26 weeks, what should we do? You are scanning wherever you are scanning it. You pick a low lying placenta. I've already described what a low lying placenta is. Who would like to tell me what we described as a low lying placenta? There were about two. I mean, what should you report as a low lying placenta? Okay, it's not yet covering, but it's in the lower segment. Are we together? So you need to understand these practical things. Okay, so we said a low lying placenta is a placenta that's like this one. It's in the lower segment, it's not encroaching onto the cervical internal os but probably within four to five centimeters from the cervical internal os. Are we together? So if you pick something like this, you see something like this, it's different from something like that. Are we together? Yes. So if at the moment we are talking about a placenta that is somehow, somehow in this position. So what do you do? If you pick that on ultrasound scan, so if you pick that and you are between 20 and 26 weeks, and the patient is not bleeding, you ask the patient to come again around 36 weeks. That is if there are no other problems like fetal growth restriction and other things. It's just a low lying placenta on a routine scan, you ask the patient to come at 36 weeks. And at 36 weeks, the placenta is in a position that is more than two centimeters from the cervical internal os. That patient can have a vaginal delivery. Are we together? Yes. And then you pick it between 20 and 26 weeks. The patient is actually bleeding. You need to reassess and manage the bleeding that the patient is having and make sure everything else is okay. And if she continues bleeding, you may need to perform a cesarean section. Maybe you may need to manage them until they are maybe around 28 to 32 weeks. And if the bleeding persists, you can do a cesarean section. You are seeing a patient for a routine scan, and then they have a placenta period. Describe three things as placenta previa. What are those? You said the placenta that's way and way. Yes, Doc. Yes. So those three aspects, a placenta that is approaching the, the leading edge is approaching the cervical internal os. The leading edge is partially covering. The leading edge is the placenta itself is completely covering the internal os of the cervix. That's placenta previa. If she's not bleeding, 
reassess at 32 weeks, not 36 weeks, like for the one with the low lying placenta and is not bleeding. Are we together? This one we see again at 32 weeks, we reassess the placental position, the cervical length, and we give antenatal steroids at 32 weeks. And then if she's bleeding, we reassess, we manage the bleeding. Remember, she's already sick. And then we keep on checking the placental position and the cervix. Is she in labor? Why is she bleeding? Probably it's heavy show. Probably she, she's prank bleeding. Is the cervix um, defacing? Is it dilating? And if bleeding stops, we deliver at 34 to 35 weeks. I think here we say around 36 weeks. For all patients with placenta previa, the one who's not bleeding, we keep on assessing. In our unit, we see them almost every two weeks, assessing the fit of growth, placental location, and the cervical length. And then if she's bleeding, she's a sick patient, we, we don't send her home. We manage the bleeding. If she stabilizes, we keep on monitoring her and we deliver around 34 to 35 weeks by cesarean section. All placentas overlying a scar should be referred to the fetal medicine units for assessment of mobile adhering placenta. Are we together? Yes, so if she has a previous scar or previous scars, the placenta is in the anterior lower segment. Obviously, it's overlying the uterine scar. Because of the scar tissue, the placenta can end up attaching morbidly into the scar, and that can cause severe morbidity for the mother. So if it's like that, she needs to be managed in a fetal medicine unit and she needs to be managed by specialist obstetrician. It's not a patient that can be delivered at a district or provincial hospital unless otherwise there is a fetal medicine unit and a specialist obstetrician. So for the first lecture, that's about all. Do we have any questions? Someone was raising their hand. Sister. We answered. Okay. Any questions before we move on? For the participants online, do we have any questions for the first lecture? So maybe I'll show it in the images for if I had already stopped the, uh, the, the share for that later. I'll show you in the slide for this later. I think I have some. So remember, uh, this is um, training for basic ultrasound scan. So the things that are, we are covering here are really basic. For us to have a starting point, we have to reduce ourselves to the basics so that we can start scanning. 
So just to remind you that the placenta has a fetal surface and a maternal surface. I think we all know that this is the fetus and this is the fetal surface. We have the placental mass here and the maternal surface of the placenta and now the uterine wall. So this is what you should imagine when you are scanning. Unfortunately, on the scan machine, it doesn't look like this, but in real life, that's what it is like. So we have already said that we should establish the placental location of every routine examination. And we should describe the relationship of the, of the placenta to the cervix. And if the patient is bleeding in the emergency room, you need to establish the placental location, not to refer the patient for a scan. Remember, this is a patient who is unwell. So in the emergency room, we are supposed to be able to assess where the placenta is and establish if it's a previa or just a low-lying placenta or a normally located placenta. We have uh, said that if they have a previous cesarean section, those are different cases. And if they have a low-lying placenta, you need to refer them. If it's a, if it's a multiple pregnancy, you need to establish the chorionicity. It's not just locating the placenta, describing its appearance, and then describing the relationship of the placenta to the cervix. It's also about establishing the chorionicity using the placenta itself or the placenta if they are true. Okay. So when we'll be scanning, we have to know the different the different places where we can locate the placenta. I've already mentioned that they can, the placenta can be in the anterior segment. About 33% uh, of the placenta, they are located in the anterior segment of the uterus. And some of them can be anterolateral. It can be wholly in the anterior segment, it can also be encroaching into the lateral segment. That's about 33% of the cases. And about 33% also are posterior. I showed you what a posterior placenta looks like. We also have found our location in about 26% of the pregnant mothers. A placenta can be located in the fundal region. It can also be in the lateral region, it's only in the lateral region, be it on the left or the right side. It can be a previa. We have described what a placenta previa is. So this is a baby. We can see placenta is anterior here, placenta is posterior, and in this case, it's fundal. The images are not that clear. You can see my shoulder. So here it's in the posterior segment, here in the anterior segment, and here it's found out. So what are the different techniques that can be used to assess the placenta? We said trans-abdominal, trans-vaginal is the standard approach if the placenta is no lying. For the technique for assessing a tra transabdominally, for assessing the placenta transabdominally, you have to place the probe in the sagittal section. Suprapubic region, sagittal section. And you sort of dip the upper edge of your probe so that you examine the inside of the pelvis. Remember that we have a big tummy, the baby is up here, but the cervix remains in the pelvis. So you place your probe in the sagittal, a probe is like that. So sagittal is along the maternal abdomen. Are we together? In the sagittal section, and you dip the upper part of the probe so that you are examining 
inside the pelvis. Inside the pelvis, you should locate the maternal bladder first as an important landmark for you to identify the cervix, the maternal cervix, and you'll be able now to say, is this placenta low lying uh, or a previous, or it's away from the cervical os. You cannot say that until you show an image showing the maternal bladder, the lower segment of the uterus, and the maternal cervix in the same image. Are we together? Yes, we are using them as landmarks to be certain that we are in the lower segment of the uterus. Are we together? So there are some things that can disturb you. If she has a full bladder, a bladder that is full and distended, it can actually distort the shape of the cell. It can compress the uterine wall onto the maternal cervix or onto the posterior wall, the anterior wall onto the posterior wall of the, of the sorry, the uterine walls can become opposed in the lower segment, the anterior and posterior. And if there's a placenta in between, if the placenta is in the lower segment, it can actually look like a placenta that's completely covering the cervix. Yet in itself, the uterine walls are being compressed by a bladder that is very full. So you need some urine in the maternal blood, but you don't want it to be over distended. So you can assess in the sagittal position, you are trying to localize the placenta in relation to the cervix, and then you also go transverse so that you can visualize the whole mass, the full mass of the placenta and describe its appearance. You have to see both margins of the placenta. You have to see the whole placental mass so that you are able to describe the appearance of the placenta. You put on color flow mapping so that you can examine the cord insertion. Where is the cord inserting? Is it a central? Insertion is it marginal? Is there filamentous scored insertion? So you put on color flow. So for the transvaginal approach, is the standard. If you are suspecting that there is a placenta pre, a low line placenta, placenta previa, or uh, yeah, if we are suspecting those two, it's safe. Even in a patient who is bleeding. Why is it safe? You are not supposed to push it all the way up into the cervix. You just insert it maybe halfway or even less than that into the maternal vagina. So if you are in the first trimester, the placenta appears just like thickening of the uterine wall. There is echogenic thickening of the uterine wall. So in studying, we, we have terms that we, we use. And unfortunately, uh, we haven't had that lecture. So the terms describe the appearance, the appearance of whatever we are looking at on scan. So if in the first trimester, the placenta will just look like Echogenic thickening of the uterine wall. You can see in this image in the anterior a myometrium based thickening around this area. That's what the placenta looks like in the first trimester. In the second trimester, I've already said that it's homogeneous in appearance, moderate echogenicity. The echogenicity, like the, the whiteness, echogenicity is. The, the whiteness of the tissues on scan are we together? So the echogenicity is more than that of the uterine muscle. We can see this is the placenta is looking a little bit whiter than 
the uterine wall. And in the third trimester, it's loss of homogeneity and appearance of calcifications and the legs that I described earlier on. This is what a third trimester placenta should look like. We have already described what a low-lying placenta is, what placenta previa is. I've already told you the pitfalls that can occur when you're assessing the placenta on a, an empty bladder. It can give you false diagnosis of a covering placenta, or if the bladder is over distended and compressing the uterine wall, it can also uh, give you false results. So all the time when you're assessing for the if the placenta is low lying or covering the, the cervical internal os, you need a pool of fluid between the presenting part and the cervical internal os. So you put a bit of fundal pressure on the mother so that there is fluid between the presenting part and the cervical internal os, and you can really see the anterior and posterior uterine walls and the cervix. In this case, we really want to see the cervical internal walls. So I'll just show you a few images of the placenta so that you can familiarize yourself with what the placenta looks like on ultrasound scan. I also want to check if you have understood how to locate the placenta on scan. So this one is a placenta that's in which segment? Let's do it quickly. It's in which segment? Okay, can we have participants from Bluewell? Can the participant from Bluewell also say something? So where is the placenta? In this image, where is it? We are just training our eyes to see the placenta and pick where the placenta is. Is it in the anterior or posterior segment? It's in the some are saying posterior, others are saying anterior. We said the first thing you have to know that this is your probe. This third thing is your probe. Okay. So this third part of the slide is your probe placed on the maternal abdomen. Immediately underneath the probe, we have the maternal anterior abdominal wall and then the uterine wall the anterior myometrium. And if we go right down, we have the posterior myometrium. Are we together? So if it's not here underneath your crop and beyond the baby, it's in the posterior uterine segment. You need to examine the whole uterine wall from the lower segment going all the way to the fundus anteriorly and posterior. Your eyes should be looking anteriorly and posteriorly so that you see that the, 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 the fetus is inside the uterus and this placenta is anteriorly or posteriorly or fundally or in the lateral segment. This one is when you see because we have a full bladder here, we cannot really see and see the cervix properly. And this placenta is looking like it's completely covering the, the cervix. 
So we should not examine a mother with an over distended bladder. We should see the cervix, the anterior myometrium and the posterior myometrium as well. Then we'll be able to say the placenta is in this position. We are just training our eyes, the different images that we can see. You see now the bladder is just half full. We can see the cervix, we can see the internal os. We can actually see that the placenta is for the same patient. We can actually see that the placenta is not covering the internal os. So this placenta is where? Where's this placenta? Posterior. Remember, we are looking at the and um, leading edge of the placenta. And in this case, you see the baby is directly on the cervical internal os. Can we see, can we see the placental mass? We can't, we cannot even see the internal os of the cervix. So you cannot examine the baby in this position and say we have ruled out placenta previa or a low lying placenta. You need either to move the baby away and have a pool of life between the baby placenta and the cervix. So that it gives you a window to examine the structures. The baby, you, you can push the baby away or you put under pressure so that you push the fluid to go just above the cervix. This placenta is also still in the posterior segment. And here we are just showing that this is the internal os and you are measuring the distance between the leading edge, leading edge of the placenta and the cervical internal os. Again, with the pool of lipa just above the cervix. Again, this is showing over distension of the bladder and how it distorts the shape of the cervix and the uterine walls, they come sort of, they approach each other and it distorts the position of the placenta. And this is showing how you check for the code in session. I said you put color flow mapping and then you move it across the placenta and check exactly where the code is inserting at. In this case, the placenta is where? It's in the anterior segment. And this one is a fundal placenta. Are we together? This is the placental mass, it's in the fundal region. This one is anterior, posterior, and we move on to the le next lecture, which is cervical length assessment. Okay, so cervical length assessment is done in the antenatal period to screen for preterm birth. So we use it to pick the patients who have a high risk of de de delivering severely preterm babies. It should not be done routinely for low risk women. It's not necessary, it's necessary to scan every pregnant mother checking for uh, screening for preterm birth. We only do it for high risk women. In the high risk women are women who have a history of current miscarriages, preterm births, and the ones who had a short cervix at the fetal anomaly scan. If a short cervix is picked, the risk of delivering preterm is increased. The risk of having a miscarriage is also increased. So it's that important. 
we are trying to avoid delivering the mothers delivering severely preterm or having miscarriages as a result of cervical incompetence. So I've explained that we should not screen every mother, every pregnant mother for preterm birth. We only screen the high risk one. And that information is actually based on research is that had done on thousands of patients and they actually showed that if you screen and identify women with short cervix, you give progesterone or you uh, put uh, cervical, you, uh, you do cervical circling, it does not make any difference. Are we together? It doesn't make any difference unless if we work with the high risk women, that's when we are going to make a difference in picking the women who have a short service and then we do something about it. We can only help high risk women. So for assessing the cervix, it can be done in three ways, transabdominally, transvaginally, which is the standard. And you are going to, to be taught how to assess the cervix using the transvaginal approach. Can also be done transperineally. So if we are doing it transabdominally, the bladder should be half full. Again, we place the probe in the sagittal position with slight rotation to the right side, slight rotation of the upper part, and then we incline the probe into the pelvis until we visualize the maternal bladder with the probe in the sagittal plane, we have full bladder, we incline the, the upper part of the probe into the uh, vagina, we rotate slightly to the right until we see the maternal bladder. We are using it as a landmark because we know the anatomical relationship between the maternal bladder, the lower uterine segment, in the cervix. When we are assessing the cervix, the cervical canal echo should be visualized throughout from the internal os to the external os. And if the cervix measures less than 25 millimeters, it's regarded to as a short cervix. So this is the maternal cervix, maternal bladder, lower segment, we have the pool of lipa. This is the cervix. And we can actually see the mucus plug, which we are referring to as the cervical canal echo, which we should see from the internal os all the way to the external os. They are using, using the transvaginal route, which we said is the standard. The bladder should be empty. Is that clear? Transabdominally, half full. Transvaginally, empty bladder. In a longitudinal view of the cervix, we should again see the cervical canal and the echo, the cervical canal echo that I've already mentioned. Then we visualize the anterior lip of the cervix and the posterior lip of the cervix. The image should be zoomed enough to fill about two thirds of the screen. We should avoid too much pressure like this. In this image, there's too much pressure that's being put on the anterior lip of the cervix. Not the correct way of doing it. Just minimal pressure on the anterior lip of the cervix. And, uh, for measuring the length, we place the calipers on the internal os, stretch them all the way to the external os. So the calipers should be placed correctly. Are we together? So for a normal cervix should have the same echogenicity as that of the uterus. 
and the cervical canal appears high K equate or sometimes ISO equate the same echogenicity is that of the uterus for the anterior and posterior lips. You can see this is the posterior lip all the way. It's looking the same as the posterior and anterior myometrial walls. Are we together? And then the cervical canal is sort of more white, tight, equate. Sometimes it's, it has the same echogenicity. Most of the cases, the cervical antenna os is closed or is just open up to about five millimeters and we report it as closed. You should visualize the mucus plug. In most of the patients, it's prominent, it's quite prominent, like what's shown in this image. So it's important for us to understand that the normal cervix at 20 to 24 weeks, on average, it measures about 35 millimeters. Are we together? So the normal is about 35 millimeters. Of course, there are variations. You can say 35 plus or minus eight or 33 plus or minus 8.5, but on average, it's about 35. And we have already said that if it measures less than 25 millimeters, it's a short cervix. So we can, Pick up patients with funneling, funneling or funneling of the cervix. That's when we have separation of the anterior and posterior layers of the cervical internal os, and we have a pool of lipa in between the anterior and posterior layers of the uterine, uh, of the myometrial root of the uterus. And we have a pool of lipa like that. And this core of light bar will be trying to progress, dilating the cervix to pop all the way at the internal os. So it can start at that point. And if you pick it up, you need to measure the distance between this posterior layer and the anterior layer. That's the extent of the cervical dilatation and the level of the internal force. Are we still together? Hmm? Are we together? Okay. Okay, so normally this is what the cervix looks like on stand. Are we together? And the internal force is this area here. When we say there is funneling, this fluid, this pool of fluid starting to go between the anterior and posterior walls of the internal cervical walls. Is that clear? Yes, we have a pool of fluid in between the walls of the cervix and it's sort of dilating the cervix. It's not yet in the external os where we say the cervix is not dilating, but we are saying we are at the internal os here and the walls have separated because a pool of fluid covered by some membranes have gone in between and this patient will be having maybe a threatening miscarriage. And it usually happens in patients with cervical incompetence. Is it clear? Okay. 